So science, like almost any other thing that people do, any human endeavor, happens at different scales. In big science, we are trying to answer the biggest questions that are out there. And more and more to answer those big questions requires very big scientific facilities. It involves scientists from many different uh, training and experience backgrounds. Right now, one of the projects I'm working on is trying to accumulate into one computational framework everything that we know about microbes and plants. It requires us bringing together experts in bacteria and ecology, computational algorithms, cloud computing, system software, visualization, user interfaces, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's a, it's a very interdisciplinary kind of problem, but it's central to making progress in medicine, bioenergy, understanding the environment, carbon cycle, climate. I mean, this is all, these problems are all connected. And it may be the sort of thing that takes decades to realize the results of, but if one looks back over time, the big science investments of decades ago certainly have come to fruition in the passage of time in terms of our economic well-being. In cancer research, big science now means the human genome sequence, and it now means being able to sequence every patient's tumor and every patient's own genetic makeup, their germline samples, and to integrate that information into choosing a targeted therapy that will hit the Achilles heel of their particular cancer. What I see in the future for infectious disease research is that advances in DNA sequencing will lead to a Scotland Yard type of work that allows us to assign the identity of microbes, their transmission, their origin, their destiny on a level that will be painstakingly accurate. The true spirit of the facility is really only met if we collaborate not just with scientists at the University of Chicago, but virtually anywhere in the country. Well, you might drive the acquisition of a machine, whether it's a supercomputer or an accelerator by one or two overarching problems. Once you have that tool and you have people around it, the expertise to use it, then you say, wow, what else can we do with this? The initial accelerators that were built were trying to discover the secrets of the subatomic and subnuclear world. Well now tens of millions of patients every year receive cancer treatments based on particle accelerators. So big science through the government directive has to focus on a particular project so that it becomes very focused research that has a very specific application. And scientists have to give up uh, some of the academic freedom to submit to this particular topic. Edison tried, you know, a thousand filaments before he got one that worked in a light bulb, right? So if you had a whole management of oversight, people said, well, okay, you know, one more failure and we're going to cut off your funding, that wouldn't work, right? People come up with this idea, it's too big to fail. But if you're too big to fail, then you never learn anything. I believe that the key to the future is to continue to generate public support and what follows from that is funding support to make sure that we continue to have the kind of labs that Fermi and Argonne have represented for many decades. A healthy scientific ecosystem really requires all of these parts. I don't think anyone would argue that we shouldn't have use-inspired or applied science research, nor that we shouldn't have fundamental research but it has to do with the balance. What's wanted is an orchestra, not a solo. The clock is ticking toward midnight, and at midnight, the ax will fall on one of the biggest budget cuts in decades. I think for a very long time, we've treated taxpayer money as an entitlement. And obviously, in recent years, there's the reality that's come around that more return is actually going to be necessary in order to sustain this type of funding for science. The average taxpayer invests about $100 annually in biomedical research, yet it costs the annual taxpayer about $8,000 a year in health care. Just the cost of cancer care alone is $277 million in the U.S. today. So I think if you asked if they were willing to pay 
uh, five dollars more or even even fifty percent more I think the vast majority of individuals would be willing when they look at the improvements that we've had in health care the decline in deaths from heart disease diabetes neurological disorders and cancer the savings is enormous and the benefit to humanity is enormous People have notions of reactors of the future that may be driven, in fact, by particle accelerators, by the sort of accelerators that we're building here for Project X based on superconducting technology. And the benefit of that is that one could design a reactor that is much safer than conventional reactors. In China, they are also pursuing this sort of technology, as is Japan and India. So this is one example where there is in fact a lot of competition throughout the world and the U.S. at the moment is not playing. If you look at the science budgets in growing economies, they have year-on-year -year growth rates in this kind of 5 to 10 percent per year level. If you look at the growth rate of science in developed economies like the U.S., you're lucky if it's a few percent, right? And if you run the clock out long enough between these two economies, eventually the economy that's growing and investing more money into science will outpace the other economy that's not growing. And then something that isn't talked about as much is the value of the inspiration of big science. And it's very hard to put a price tag on that. Kids, the public, are incredibly inspired by the sort of big science that we do. And the incredible questions, many of which are childlike in nature, you know, what's the universe made of? What is this physical world around us? It's about taking a public that doesn't really understand what science is about and giving them a pathway, giving them entry points, and not only giving them those entry points, but lighting a spark in them to become engaged and excited about science. Science is a way of life. It's a way of looking at the world. It's cool, it's fun, and we're getting more than our dollars are worth out of investing in that.